my talk. Normally I like to walk around the stage, so I'm gonna try and be really still this time because there's no mic that allows me to do that, but louder, I can't speak much louder. This is about as loud as I speak. You want me to shout? Um, so, uh, hi, I'm Seven uh, from Orchid, one of the co-founders and CEO, and I'm here to talk to you about surveillance capitalism, how to reclaim your privacy. That's me. <coughs> So I, I'm a bit older than some of you, um, and I've been around since the kind of early days of the web, and back when we all started getting online, even before the web, the idea with the internet was it's this like, place of freedom, a place you could like, discover things and chat to people, maybe people didn't know, something good, something bad, but uh, there was just like, this really cool place where you could just get free, like do different things and discover stuff, learn things, and I think that most of us here were building things and we're getting excited about different ideas, and the idea that you wouldn't be able to do that seems really strange to us. Um, so, but right now, when you use the internet, you're taking a risk. And I think many of you understand this idea, um, but many people don't get it. But it's starting to spread. The news of like, what's actually happening out there is, uh, is getting out there, whether it's state-controlled, state surveillance and censorship, or uh, corporations and Last couple of years, we've had Facebook, we've had Google, we've had tons of hacks, tons of situations where we're starting to realize that the thing that we thought was a safe place is actually not quite so safe. And when you look out into the broader world, we're actually relatively lucky in this country. Um, yeah, we might be concerned about Facebook and the NSA and the things that Snowden told us, but when you get into other countries, you're not only facing a situation of surveillance, sometimes this is a matter of life or death. When you're trying to uprise against a government that's really oppressing people in situations in Bolivia recently. Um, I was fortunate enough to hang out with uh, some of the fellows from the Human Rights Foundation recently, and I met people who were leaders in the Hong Kong student protest, uh, leaders in the Bolivian uprising, and we don't always, we're not always conscious of what's really happening on the human level here, but if you think about it, these people can't safely connect the internet and tweet about what's going on. They can't safely connect the internet and communicate with somebody. And we're not talking like people who want to go out and you know, start an uprising that's violent. We're talking about people who just want to find out and get the word out about what's going on. And uh, I have a low battery. Um, Switch ports. OK, one second. Do you have a charger here? All right, I'm gonna keep talking while I also do this, so uh, I can do more than one thing at once. So the, um, one of the most recent, really scary examples of this situation is in the, China right now. Uh, I think you're all probably aware of the virus that's spreading um, perhaps more rapidly than we realized. We good? Okay, maybe not. Um, so one of the really scary things that came out recently is, very sadly, the, one of the guys who was, uh, one of the doctors who was trying to spread the word about what was happening on WeChat, um, he died. And the surveillance and the censorship, especially the censorship that's happened in China as a result of uh, their strict controls on what information can be spread and their idea about they need to control the narrative and they need to control the information going out there, um, really has led to uh, perhaps a slow response internationally, and especially in China, than would otherwise have been necessary. And that trade that the Chinese people are willing to take with the party, where they say, we will accept surveillance and censorship as long as you keep us safe, is starting to switch. So we see that the tech that made our lives easier and faster and better has also made surveillance much easier. And I think that even in decentralized technologies where we believe that uh, we're building something that is going to naturally help us be private and all these things. That's not necessarily true. You can also build stable coins, like the Chinese stable coin they're building. And you can build in KYC and tracking and all these things really, really well using blockchain technology. So you can build a system of perfect control. <laughs> okay. Having some technical issues here. Um, and when we come back to the US and we think about Facebook. So yeah, it's free, but you're also trading it. You guys are probably familiar with this idea. You, you, you are the product. You are the, the product that they make money from. That doesn't necessarily mean that you should be paid for all that work, but at least you should be private. Um, and these business models, this concept has been uh, coined as a very interesting book um, called Surveillance Capitalism. It's the idea that the, 
That's blinking. <laughs> it's the idea that um, the business model that was built around the Web 1.0 and Web 2.0 architecture was almost like necess necessitated the idea that you were going to build advertising. The, the first um, search engine, one of the first search engines, Hotbot, they were the first people to put banner ads in there. And I remember everyone saying, like, oh, that's a crazy idea. No one's going to click on these banner ads. and That's just nonsense. But then you got the dot-com boom. And another example is when uh, cookies first came along. And I remember thinking, that just seems like no one's going to trade their privacy. And why would you want tracking? And then we have an enormous ad tech market built on that technology. And people are starting to question this. And the data is starting to support a lot of the hypotheses. So many years ago, I was very concerned about this. I was, came into the crypto space in 2013 and started a fund called Pantera. And then over that period of time, my concerns about privacy and surveillance also increased. And then three years ago, when we started Orchid, this was a deal, but now it's becoming a bigger and bigger deal. And so more and more people, when you ask them, are starting to become concerned. And this is also um, generationally dependent. The younger generation is way more uh, concerned about this. So what if we could change the surveillance capitalism? What if we could turn surveillance capitalism into privacy capitalism? I mean, some people here would say that we don't need capitalism at all, but that's a completely different conversation. But privacy capitalism, what if we could build business models where privacy wasn't something that we just pushed out there as another way to get people hooked in, and in fact, we're just building another surveillance model? And with the decentralized technologies that are core to all the stuff that's happening in this building and in the community in general, we actually have the opportunity to do this. So the area that we've been focusing on in particular um, there's a talk I gave a few years ago talking about what does decentralized technologies really help you with? Like, what's the killer app? So we have Bitcoin, where the killer app is breaking the centralized control of banks and of governments. And then we have Ethereum, where at the time, the killer app was really breaking the old boys club of Silicon Valley, like changing that funding structure. Can we fund experiments? And we have been really focused on breaking the control structures of communications. So communication control structures are governments, ISPs, corporations, all the people who want to control what you want to say and control what you want to do. And so virtual private networks or VPNs, hey, push it in really hard. It's really hard. Do you want me to hold it? USB C? My computer? Yeah. Do I have any other ports? I have three more ports. Let's try this. after this commercial break brought to you by East Denver. So one of the problems with, e there's a couple problems with, uh, many problems with VPNs right now. So, sorry. Um, so one of the problems is, it's, it's, it's called, it's like a paid man in the middle attack. So you're paying someone to watch all your traffic. And they say, oh no, 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 we don't log your traffic, and you know, we, it's like nothing happens here, nothing to see. But in reality, when the facts come out, sometimes they get a subpoena, sometimes they get an order, and it turns out they are logging your data. And there's some good ones, and we've actually partnered with many of the good ones, I'll tell you in a minute. But um, the other problem is it's not transparency. You have no idea what's going on. It's not open source. They're not going to tell you how they do it. And uh, the, there are currently open source solutions around there, but the other problem they have is they're not incentivized. So why would I want to run a bunch of servers for a bunch of people to route the traffic through when you're not paying me? Like this whole place, five minutes? Okay. This whole place is built around the idea that incentivization is cool. Like having people take ownership of things, have a stake in something they're building. We've seen what happens when you do that with Facebook and you don't do it. And so our system, again, decentralized, we're built on Ethereum, ERC20 token, and all the smart contract structures are available to that. We're transparent, we're open source, um, and we're also incentivized. And we also figured out, and there was a really cool session by my two friends here, Justin and Nathan, in that room this morning, which some of you missed, um, talking about our payments technology. So we've developed an alternative to regular payment channels um, called probabilistic nanopayments. Uh, we were going to call it micropayments, but that term has already been overloaded. So we call them nanopayments because they're really small. And the idea with them is, is that we can make payments on a packet level. Like, I'll just let that sink in for a minute. So everyone's worried about doing visa level speeds and so on. We do packet level transactions. And you can find out much more about that at our booth upstairs. I'm not going to get into the details there. It's really cool, though. So um, we also have multiple hops. So there's a couple of smaller VPNs that offer a few things like multiple hops. But we're pushing this out idea, idea where you can just string different nodes together in the Orchid app and therefore protect your IP information. 
And in addition, in the way we do nanopayments and setting up our different smart contracts and all the things the guys can tell you about upstairs, we're also able to offer different levels of payment anonymity as well. So if you kind of think about it, people say, oh, well, what about like, all the bad things that might happen and so on? I'm like, listen, you can go and declare VPNs illegal if you like, but what we're doing is we're actually trying to build the VPN that you expected, as in like you pay for it and it is private and no one's logging it and all the things that you thought you were paying for but you actually weren't getting. The other interesting things that are happening is within this decentralized community, it's not just us. There's many people, and I was a seed investor in Zcash and um, friends with Zuko. That's one of the most interesting projects, and that technology around zero knowledge proofs, I believe, is going to really change a lot of things out there. Um, Aztec's another protocol with Ethereum. There's lots of companies looking at this idea of how do we make things private by making them decentralized. And uh, we're really excited to, to look at that, to partner with people. I think I'm out of time, but if you want to get in touch with us, we will be up at the booth. We're handing out free Orchid accounts um, upstairs with a little code you can scan. And uh, we're very interested to get in touch with. Um, come by and see us. We're here all weekend. Thank you.